All right. Hey, let's pray. Let's pray. God, we just love you so much, and we thank you, Lord, uh, for the gift of laughter. We thank you, Father, that uh, you, uh, you, you sent your son Jesus down to this earth so we could have joy and have it abundantly. And so, Father, I thank you that we can be a church that is uh, willing and able to laugh, uh, laugh, and also, Father, a church that's willing, uh, willing and able to look at ourselves and to make changes, Father, in the areas that we need to make changes in. I thank you, God, for this awesome day. I thank you for this awesome opportunity, Lord, to speak your word. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would, um, you please, God, take over, and there'd be more of you and less of me, and God, that you would help me to speak the words that you want me to speak tonight. And uh, God, I thank you for your word. I pray that we would take it seriously. And as we open it up, God, that we would um, love your word, absorb your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So John, there's a bit of a, a tin can sound. If you could work on that, please. So before I get started uh, on my message, I just got to say that, uh, man, what a just an amazing week I've had. Um, just seeing God's beauty and God's love and God's forgiveness and God's mercy and God's grace and, and just seeing it in, in whole new ways and just watching God work in my life, uh, in the lives around me, um, just talking with people and hearing their stories about what God has done in their lives. And... Um, I read something this week about this young man posted uh, something about churches and how uh, he's done with church. Um, church is a place where people are judgmental, um, where they only care about themselves, where they um, um, are hypocritical, um, and they think that they have it together and nobody else does, and uh, just things of that sort. And he went on a rant, and I read some of the comments, and, and about half and half, half of them were, you're darn right, buddy, you know, and a lot of expletives um, explaining how right this guy was, and, and then the other half saying, uh, you know, God is a God of this and that and this and that, and trying to defend God, and I think probably causing more trouble than they they uh, helped. And uh, as I was praying tonight, I just, um, I pray this a lot. I pray, God, help us to be the church that you want us to be. Um, I have a lot of vision. I, um, I'm lucky I'm surrounded by people of action who can put my crazy visions and thoughts into actually doing them. Um, I have a lot of ideas. Um, I'm, I'm a, a thinker. I think a lot. And uh, I don't ever want my vision to get in the way of God's vision. And so I pray that prayer a lot. I journaled this the other day that, God, I just want to do and say what you want us to do and say. I want to be a church that you want us to be. And so as I was walking in tonight, um, I saw a person helping another person carry in some items and in one hand, the person had a bag of clothing that we're going to give to people who don't have, other than the clothes on our back, don't have another set of clothes. And in the other hand, I saw him carrying in a bag of non-perishable items that we're going to give to young kids to take home on the weekend so that they have food in their home over the weekend for a local school in our area. And it's, it's just something that we do. It's a weekly occurrence. You'll weekly, you'll see things collected and things stacked up. And uh, it, it was just so apparent to me that this is what God is calling us to do. Feed those who are hungry. Clothe those who are naked. Don't just say, oh, well, man, I'll pray for you. <laughs> Hope you find some clothes. Help them give them clothes, give them food. And, um, you know, some would argue that that's enabling. Some would argue that you are only making the problem worse. If um, we're going to be guilty of anything when we stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I want it to be that 
hey, we tried. We did our best to help people the best that we could. And um, so anyway, I just want to tell you that um, I don't want to speak for God, but man, I just think God is so proud of you guys. I think he's so proud of you. I think he's so proud of, of what you're doing in this church, through this church and this community to help others. And the Luke 14 project is just one of the many projects that we're going to take on. And um, God is proud. God is proud. I read his word. I read this, this beautiful book. And I believe that we're doing the things that he's calling us to do. So um, if no one's told you lately that God is proud of you, I want to tell you, God is proud of you. God is proud of you. Way to go. Good job. All right. So to the message. We're in our series called, What is Love? Yeah, baby, don't hurt me. I heard at least three people say it. Every time I say it, the same thing that comes to my head. Oftentimes in fairy tales, the last sentence of the book says, and they lived. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't you like to see Snow White and Prince Charming like after the big moment, like after they've had like two or three kids, right? And they're like hanging and she's vacuuming and, uh, Mr. Charming, could you get this kid off my leg, right? I mean, wouldn't you like to see the rest of the story, yeah. right? Because you're kind of seeing the honeymoon. You're kind of seeing the good part and then life happens, right? In 1950, I don't know if you knew this or not, in 1950, only 11% of marriages, of marriages ended in divorce. 11%. So one out of 10. One out of 10 marriages ended in divorce. 1950, there was a law passed called a no-fault divorce law. And it was ironically passed in 1949 by then governor of California, Ronald Reagan. He passed the law, and part of the reason he passed the law was because he was married before, and his ex-wife said some very dispersing things about him and very cruel things about him, because you had to have a reason before that to get divorced. You couldn't just say, I don't like him anymore. The judge would say, well, too bad. You got to have a reason. And so he said this, this his ex-wife made up some things, and so he, will, he would later go on to say that that was one of the worst decisions that he'd ever made as a human being, as a man. Um, I read that and I was just like, no, Ron, what are you doing? Because I'm a, Ronald Reagan's one of my, one of my heroes, the great president in my opinion. And so when I found out after the fact that in his later memoirs that he said that that's the worst, one of the worst decisions he ever made, made me feel a lot better about him. I believe that marriages today fail so much because we don't put a high enough priority on them. We don't put a high enough value on them. Tonight's message is entitled, Happily Ever After. Now, let me say this. If you're married tonight, then you should take a lot of notes. <laughs> All right? If you are here tonight and someday you plan on being married, you should take a lot of notes. You should probably take more notes. Because the other people, they've already messed things up, so you get a fresh start. Just kidding. If you're here tonight and you say, I don't ever plan on being married again, well, hopefully you have people in your life that you are going to invest in. You're going to have children and grandchildren who are going to someday come to you and look for wisdom. Because let me tell you something. One thing about having white hair is people think you're really, really smart. They come to you and they ask you questions and they're looking at you like, wow, you know, and I'm like, I wasn't that smart. <laughs> it's because I have white hair, right? Seriously, you're going to want to invest in somebody and so you're going to want to know things about relationships and about marriage and what it really stands for. So getting right into it, point number one in your notes is this. We need to understand how God feels about marriage. We're going to live happily ever after. We have to understand how God feels about marriage. 
Malachi chapter 2. By the way, um, you can turn in your Bibles if you want to. I'm going to be flipping a lot tonight um, through the, the scriptures all over the place. Um, so you can either read it on the screen or you can try to keep up. It's up to you. I won't wait for you. So Malachi chapter 2 verse 15 says this. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce. Wait, wait a minute. God doesn't hate, does he? God probably really dislikes it, huh? Maybe he's really not that fond of, no, no, no. God hates divorce. Exclamation mark. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart. Do not be unfaithful to your wife. What's going on here is Israel is a mess. And they're saying, well, wait a minute. We're, we're praying and we're, we're offering sacrifices and we're, we're doing all the right things. And Malachi is saying, no, you're not. You know what you're doing? You sit there and you cry tears on the altar and say, why won't you help us? And God's saying, the reason why is because you're treating your wives poorly. Now, you can apply this either way, but just back then, women were considered more property than a wife, and God's saying, listen, I never planned it that way. You need to treat your wife with honor, respect, and dignity. So God hates divorce. Now, I'm going to say this. If you're here tonight and you've been divorced, we serve a God of love and grace and compassion and forgiveness. So if you are here tonight and you've been divorced, welcome to the club. I've been divorced as well when I was 21 years old, 22 years old. So God forgives. Um, there are sometimes things that happen and... You know, people leave people and people make choices that you don't have any control over. And so if you're here tonight, you've been divorced. Don't beat yourself up over that. You know, ask forgiveness, move forward, and live the life that God's created you to live. So God says he hates divorce and he says it's cruel. He wants you to be loyal and faithful to your spouse. And I love how, just like we talked about last week, it says it here again, to guard your heart. Listen, there is an enemy and he wants to kill, steal, and destroy anything that God values. Now, as I said before, you're not going to hear me talk a lot in here about the devil because the devil has no authority or no power over you if you're a Christ follower, and he certainly doesn't hold a candle to our God. So our God is bigger than any of that. However, there is a real enemy, and he is on the prowl, and he's looking to kill, steal, and destroy anything that God puts a high value on, and God puts a high value on marriage. When you say, I do, you will be under attack. Your marriage will be under attack. Now, is it overwhelming to you? No, you have much more power than any devil in hell has as long as you have Jesus Christ as your Savior. So God places a high value on marriage. We need to understand, understand how God feels about marriage. We need to understand that God doesn't just take marriage lightly. God doesn't just sit there and say, oh, well, yeah, they're getting married. No, no, you're making a covenant union with God. You are coming together in front of people and in front of God, and you're saying, God, I make a covenant with you that I'm going to spend the rest of my life with her, with him in holy matrimony. We're going to be married till death do we part. And what God has joined together, we're going to read a little bit later, let no man separate. God has a high value of marriage. The second point in your notes is men need to step up and lead. We want to live happily ever after? Men need to step up and lead. Sorry, men, don't look at me that way. It's God, not me. Me mad, me mad at him. Genesis chapter three, the first union that God brought together. This is pretty long, so bear with me. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Anytime anything contradicts something that God has said, that's a big red flag. 
Of course, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, a woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not, al- are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you will, be good. you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to the husband who was with her. There's a serpent talking to your wife (laughs) and you are with her and you're sitting there doing what? That's what I want to know. One of the things I'm going to say, Adam, listen, bro, a whole sin thing, I get it. I sinned a billion times, man. I don't blame you for that. But what were you doing when all this was going on? Sitting there going, oh yeah, good one, devil. I mean, well... (laughs) And she gave some. At that moment, their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame and their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blown, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord. Stupid thing to do because you can't hide from God. And the Lord came, uh, Lord God, among the trees. And the Lord God called to the man, "Where are you?" Who did he call to? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked, have you you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked, you can't make this stuff up. It's in the Bible. (laughs) Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Then he said to the woman, this explains a lot right here. I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy. All women say, way to go, Eve. And in pain, you will give birth. And you will, listen, desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And to the man, he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. And your life, in your life, you will struggle, all your life you will struggle to scratch your living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains by the sweat of your brow and you will... And will you, will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made? You were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Three things Adam was. First of all, he was silent. Men, we need to engage. Even when we don't want to engage, we need to engage. Our usually number one go-to is The silent treatment. Yes? Men? Yes? Usually when there's... (laughs) I said men, not you answering for him. (laughs) Yeah. Mm, Yeah. You better shake your head yes. (laughs) Adam was silent. Men, we are often silent. We get to a point where we are done and we uh, just check out of the argument, check out of the conflict. And let me tell you, I have been and can still be the king of the silent treatment. This was my go-to for many, many, many years. And it cost me a lot in my marriage. Don't be silent. Engage. Continue to have conversation Do you need to walk away when things start to get really, really toxic and mean and brutal? And if you're going to say something that you shouldn't say, absolutely. Walk away, but let your wife know we're going to continue this conversation later, and you continue the conversation. You bring it up. 
You bring up the conversation. You lead. You say, hey, listen, we stopped earlier because neither one of us were, were treating each other with honor and respect, so we need to continue this conversation, and here's how it's going to go. I'm going to allow you to talk, and I'm going to listen. Then I'm, you're going to allow me to talk, and I, you're going to listen. And that's the way that we communicate. The second thing was Adam was passive. What was he doing? The whole time this is going on, he's right there. And his wife is having this conversation that is, he has to know it's not right. God told you. You have to step up. Men, we have to step up. We have to not be passive. We have to say, no, we're not going to do that. It is not your wife telling the family that we're not going to do things that we shouldn't be doing. You need to tell them. You need to not be passive and step up and lead your home. Amen. The third thing, Adam, was irresponsible. Good leaders always take very little, if no credit, when things are, go well, and they take all the blame when things go wrong. That's what good leaders do. Poor leaders go like this. The woman you gave me, her, it's like, dude, you created her. I was fine. I had all my ribs too. Now all of a sudden she's here and I'm missing a rib, right? Irresponsible. Didn't take responsibility. Now, there may be women in here that when I say, allow a man to lead or men you need to lead, you go, and you cringe up because you've been abused and you've been um, hurt and you've been um, ruled over with an iron fist. That is not what I'm talking about whatsoever. What I'm talking about tonight is servant leadership. And let me say this loud and clear. If you are ever in a relationship where you are being hurt physically or threatened physically, get out. Get out and get out fast and find help. Find help. Nobody has the right to ever lay their hands on you. That's crossing the line. And you come to the church. We got guys here that are really big and are barely saved. So... They just gave their life to Jesus. <laughs> what I'm talking about is servant leadership. Servant leadership. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. That's Jesus talking. And the Bible says, Men, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You ever been in, in a workplace where you have a boss who's telling you what to do but has no idea what they're doing? Yes. <laughs> have you ever been in a place where you have a boss who knows not, doesn't know what he's doing, has no clue what he's doing, and is telling you what to do, and, and is telling you what to do, and he shouldn't be doing it, and you like it? Oh, no. <laughs> the Bible says, the famous scripture that the feminists point to, that this is why the Bible's no good and Christians are no good, is the whole wives submit to your husbands. They fail to read the whole portion of scripture. First of all, at the top it says, husbands and wives submit to one another in reverence and love for Jesus Christ. Amen. Number one. Number two, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. If you have a husband who is loving you and giving up his rights for your rights and for your family, and he's doing the things and he's honoring you and lifting you up, you have no problem serving him and no problem following him. Zero, I promise you that. And every woman would say, yeah, if I had a man like that. <laughs> when we as men want our wives to model something or want to do something, we model it for them. Amen. Right? I'll give you an example. Sir Alex. Oh, come, come here, buddy. <laughs> Sir Alex. <laughs> okay, now you're just Alex. Lose the accent. Okay. <laughs> Alex is 
going to be the bottle picker upper guy. All right? All right, but, but you have no idea how to pick up a bottle. No one's been sh- trained. No one's showed you how to pick up a bottle. So if I were to come to you and say, hey, Alex, I want you to be bottle picker, up, bottle picker upper guy. Bottle picker upper guy. <laughs> but I've never shown you. You have no idea how to do it. I say, be bottle, bottle picker upper guy, and I walk away. What kind of leader would I be? You can say lousy. Just don't say any curse words. Okay. Really bad. Really bad. Really bad leader, right? What if I say, hey, Alex, you're going to be bottle picker upper guy. I want you, what you to do is I want you to bend with your you know, knee. Don't, don't bend with your back like this and pick up the bottles. And then I want you to put them back over here. So now, kind of so now you try it. Now you, you try the bottle thing. <laughs> you know, you know. Did it hurt when she hit you in the head with a bottle? Yeah, anyway. All right. Put the bottle where it belongs. All right, good job, Sir Alex. Have a seat. Man, I really, really want my wife to do this, and she won't do that, and even, even, even. Well, you show her. Model it for her. And here's another thing. We are leaders, men, in our home. Here's how we lead. We don't lead, okay, we're going that way. We don't lead like this, right? Got this? Two fingers side by side. No, no, no. We lead like this, right? This is a leader follower. This is a leader follower. This is two people going who knows where. <laughs> this is a leader. This is a follower. Leader, follower. You lead the way. And then she will follow. Don't expect her to do the things that you're not willing to do yourself. We need to lead well in our homes. Women, we need to allow our husbands to lead. We need to allow our husbands to lead. It's, it's hard, especially if you've been the leader of the home for so long. When you've been the leader of the home, your whole marriage, and then he says, hey, I'm going to try this thing out. And if you go, yeah, right. He's not going to want to lead. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to encourage him in his leadership, which leads us to our next point is we need to speak words of life, not words of death into our marriage. We'll go through some Proverbs really quick. The words of the godly are a life-giving fountain, Proverbs 10, 11. The words of the godly are like sterling silver, Proverbs 10, 20. The words of the godly encourage many, Proverbs 10, 21. The lips of the godly speak helpful words, Proverbs 10, 32. The heart of the godly think carefully before speaking, Proverbs 15, 28. How many of you would like to be godly? Yeah. Not God. Godly, right? I want to be, I want to be more like God every day. Some days are better than others, right? But I want to be godly every day of my life. Well, if we're going to be godly, we need to speak words of life. We need to speak words of love, words of encouragement. It's amazing to me how many couples I see who, instead of having Team James, they have Team Julie against Team Frank. It's this is my team and my team. And then they use their kids as little pawns sometimes. It's just terrible. I see it happen over and over and over again. Your wife is not your enemy. She's your partner. Out there is your enemy. Sometimes your kids are the enemy, right? <laughs> you are a team. You are together. You are a unit. God has brought you together to get through this life together. You rely on him. She relies on you. You guys go through battles together. Hey, you know what? No one's going to keep my man down. No one's going to keep my woman down. Lena and I have got to a point in our marriage where it's, it's so beautiful because there's times where I'm just down and she brings me up and there's times when she's down and I bring her up and we're able to, to counter each other. Every once in a while, it's like a perfect storm where we're both down. That's rough. I'm not going to lie. It's rough. And we got to go back and we have to pray together. And we have to just, I mean, a lot of times we just, we can't figure things out. We're just arguing. We're snapping at each other. And it's just like, there's no hope for anywhere we're going. So you know what we do? We just say, you know what? Stop it. Let's just stop and pray. Amen. Let's just stop and pray. I, I challenge you. I double dog, triple dog dare you <laughs> to be in the middle of a fight with your spouse Stop and pray blessings on them and then continue fighting afterwards. 
I tell you, if you do it, then come see me because you'll be the first one ever in the history of mankind. <laughs> Stop. Sometimes, you know what? It doesn't matter who left the frying pan in the wrong place. Who cares? Blame it on the kids, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Think about probably, come on, be real. Amen or high five or hands up if you agree with this. Like 75% of the garbage we fought about is stupid, right? Yeah. It is. Yeah. And you get done and you're like, oh, yeah. and then you're looking like, what were we fighting about? Well, you remember the cat had a little, you know, thing in a litter box and we were, oh, <laughs> yeah, that was so stupid. Yeah, but you spent a day and a half apart, yeah. right? Getting fired up. <laughs> what do the words sound like in your marriage? What is the tone? What is the motive? Here's some things to look at when you're talking to your spouse. Think about these things. What does my facial expressions look like? Right? I'm going to call the ladies out. You guys are so good at this. Oh, you're just beautiful today. <laughs> right? What? I said he was beautiful. What's wrong with that? No, no, no. It was your tone, your body language, your facial expressions. Oh, I just love you. All I said is I loved her. Next thing you know, she was mad at me. Right? Come on. Your tone, your facial expressions, your body language, and then your words. Words are so powerful, and words are so cutting. Man, James talks a lot about words. Read through James, man. He talks so much about words and the way that we speak to one another. It's like, man, how can you speak to somebody with venom one minute, with this poison in the next minute, be praising God? That's just not right. James is saying something is not right. Your heart is one way, but it cannot be both because good water can't flow from the same place that bad water flows from. Something like that. Troy Asher version. But it says something like that. That's good Bible right there. You need to read it. Ask yourself this question and be honest with yourself. And I want you guys to really think about this this week. Do you want your spouse to be great? If not, you should. You should be their biggest fan. You should want your spouse to be great. Next point in your notes. We need to stick to a plan A and get rid of plan B. If any of you guys have ever been to a wedding that I've done, you've heard me talk about this. This is the best advice that I can give young, I can, I can give married couples, period. Matthew 19. Matthew 19, four through six. It says this. This is Jesus, red letters. Jesus says, haven't you read the scriptures? You guys ever hear me say that? Read your Bibles. Don't just listen to me. Read your Bibles. Read it for yourself. Read your Bible. Get in your word. Jesus said it too. Haven't you been reading your Bible? They record that from the beginning of time, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one zero, not a zip, no one split apart what God has joined together. Amen. No one. I have had conversations in my office with couples, and I often, um, do, when I do marriage counseling, um, they will come into my office and they're upset. Their marriage usually is like about a two or a one on a scale of one to ten. Um, just side note, Go see a counselor, somebody about your marriage when your marriage is a five. When it gets to a five, go see somebody. Be smart. Don't wait till it's a two. Because you can get it from a two to a four, and then from a four to a six. You can't go from a two to an eight. This doesn't work that way. Back to the, back to the text. So people come to my office, and every time I say, what's the problem? And they say, she says, He's a jerk. He doesn't do anything right. He's this and that, and he's a problem. He says, she doesn't do this. She doesn't do that. She doesn't do this. She doesn't do that. What's awesome is 
like the third time I meet with them, second or third time, usually third time I meet with them, I do this, this is a rule. They, they walk in and I say, okay, here's what we're going to do. You're going to tell me what you need to work on in your life, and you're going to tell me what you need to work on in your life to be a better man of God, to be a better woman of God. What do you need to work on in you? What do you need to work on in you? And they go like this. I don't know. What do I need to work on? <laughs> Happens every time. Anyway, so they're telling me how bad one another is, and I asked them this question. I said, okay, so here we are, and this is where your marriage is at. What's your plan B? What do you mean? Well, what if plan A, this doesn't work out? What's your plan B? What are you going to do? I've heard people make stuff up on the spot. I've heard people say, well, I can get by on my own. I did it before. I can do it again, right? I've heard people say, oh, I'd be better off without her. I've heard people say, well, there's an apartment over here that I've already priced out. I've talked to a lawyer, and I've got this figured out. And if this doesn't work out, it, and they've got very, very elaborate plan Bs. They've thought it through very, very, very well. My answer, to my statement to them after that is, well, therein lies your problem. And there should never, ever be a plan B. Ever. Because guess what? As long as you have plan B, it can be plan B right here. It can be over here. It can even be back here somewhere. I've got a plan B. I can see it if you don't. Eh. As long as you have plan B, then you will never be 100% committed to plan A. Yeah. Never. People say, oh, come on, Troy. What would you do if Lena did this? What if, she, what if Lena left? I said, well, I'd follow her. <laughs> she would get the ding dong wherever she's at, my suitcase in hand. Hi. This is where we're staying, huh? <laughs> All right. You can't come in. Okay, I'll be in a car waiting for you when you come out. There's no plan B. What if she's an ax murderer? Well, I guess I'll be going to prison and visiting her, right? There's no plan B. There's Lena Asher for my life. That's it. There's no, I, I don't think there's no one else for me. And there never will be another one for me. I always tell Lena, man, I've got to go first because if you go first, I'd be a lonely dude because <laughs> to set the bar so high, there's no one's going to ever be able to compare to you, right? Yeah, guys, write that down. That's good stuff. We need to stick, to stick to plan A. We need to get rid of plan B. If you've got a plan B, if you've got... Listen, this is one of my favorite sayings. If the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, well, then take care of your grass. Yeah. Fertilize it, water it, go down the street, get some manure. I don't care. Whatever you got to do. Stink your marriage back. I don't care. Do something. Bring it back. Bring it back. What God has joined together, let no man separate. Every time I do premarital counseling, I tell the young people, I didn't say this last week, I say, I'll say it this week. When I do premarital counseling, I say it at the beginning, I say it at the end. You guys are probably saying, hey, you're the worst premarital counselor ever. Well, maybe. I say this. I would rather you two, talking to the couple, I would say, I say I'd rather you two come to me the day of your wedding and say, Pastor Troy, I can't do it. I can't commit for a lifetime with this person. I, can, I just can't make that commitment to God. I would rather you do that. And I'll go tell those 200 people, hey, find something else to do because there's no wedding today. <laughs> I would rather do that than for you to go through and make a covenant with God and this person here and all these people that are watching and then bail out on your covenant. Because let me tell you something about covenants. You read the Bible, every time a covenant with God is broken, there's always consequences. Every time. No exceptions. Every single time. Last point is this. I got to hurry through this. We need to forgive and forget. We need to forgive and forget. Psalm 86.5, this is one of my, coming, becoming one of my favorite verses to use 
with life and pastoring. Oh, Lord, you are so good, so ready to forgive, so full of unfailing love for all who ask for your help. God is ready to forgive you. God is saying, Troy, buddy, I love you. I love you so much you're living below your inheritance as my son. Troy, you're living below the inheritance that I've given you as my son. I'm the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and you are my son. You are a prince. You are royalty. I'm ready. I can't wait to forgive you. I'm ready to forgive. So we're godly people. Yes, we already talked about that earlier. Little God, little G, godly people. That's what we are. If it's, God is so ready to forgive us, why are we so ready to hold grudges? Why do we always have to have this little thing that we hold on to to have the upper hand in a relationship? I see so many people where something has happened. There's, a, there's adultery or there's, um, the man is looking at stuff on a computer that he shouldn't be looking at. Um, there's a, a, a woman or a man that, that the woman was looking, talking to and got caught. Or there's always something that's the big sin, right? It's the big one where it's like you have your finger on the atom bomb. You're in a relationship, and you've got the atom bomb. Why? Because they did that thing three years ago. And you sit there, and you get in any argument you get into, and you're starting to lose the argument, and the person's saying, hey, you shouldn't be treating me like that. Oh, I shouldn't you be treating you like that? Well, at least I didn't. Game over. I win. Yeah, you're right. I shouldn't have done that. I was wrong. Sorry again. I'm a jerk. I'm a loser. Let's just go on through life being miserable. All right. Got him. I see it happen over and over again. Forgive and forget. Did you know the Bible says that God remembers your sin no more? You say, oh, God absent-minded? God, I'm so sorry for the sin I did. I already asked you for forgiveness 10 times. And God goes, oh, really? Oh, I don't remember that one, Troy. No, no, no. God chooses, chooses to remember your sin no more. As far as the east is from the west to the bottom of the deepest ocean. He remembers your sin no more. Yet when it comes to relationships, especially husband and wife relationships, we want to hold on to something and we want to be able to hold it against them until the day we die. And guess what? Your relationship's always going to be like this. There's always going to be a wedge in between you and your spouse until you can say, you know what? I'm never bringing that up again, ever. It's off limits. I'm not doing it. In conclusion, I want to close with this. I was a youth pastor for about six years, I think, seven years. Had totally brown, full head of hair. (laughs) Came a youth pastor, bam. Anyway, I actually love being a youth pastor. One of some of the greatest years of my life. I love kids. I love teenagers. They're awesome. And we would do small groups. And you can ask my wife, she was a small group leader, ask any uh, young people who do um, small groups within teenagers, and they'll tell you this exact same thing. We would have conversations with teenagers. And we would say, so what are you dealing with? You know, what, what's the deep things? And kids will get really deep. If you love a child, you love a, a young person, a teenager, and you let them know that you care about them and you love them, they will open up to you. Yeah. They will have beautiful conversations. They'll be completely vulnerable because kids are like that. They're not messed up like us. Anyway, um, so just kidding. So we would have these conversations with these kids and just about every single kid who had a hurt in their, in their relationship, it wasn't, because of, it wasn't because of their boyfriend or their girlfriend. I mean, they would come up to us and, oh, Joey broke up with me. Like, oh, you'll be okay. You'll, you'll be gone in a week anyway. And, and it wasn't those kind. But, but when we got really deep down, and what are the things that really, really scar you? Just about every child who just broke down was, I want my mom and dad back together again. 
every time. Ask a youth leader, they'll tell you. That is what is crushing young people. Listen, if you're married and you have children, you are their world. People tell me, oh no, Troy, you don't know what my relationship looked like. No, 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 no. They were, they're better off with us being apart. No, they're not. Were you hitting her? No, but no, no, they're not. Uh Uh-uh. Your kids are not better off. They're not. They're better off if they see parents who say, you know what? I don't care what comes against us. I don't care how hard finances are. I don't care what we have to get over and what we have to persevere through, but we will persevere. Why? Because what God has joined together, no man will separate. That's what our nation needs. That's what we need as people. That's what we need to do as parents. We need to be fighters. We become a nation of quitters. We need to stand up, be strong, and fight for our marriages, fight for our relationships, fight for our families. Amen? Let's pray. God, we love you so much. And we worship you and praise you and thank you, God, that you love us. God, we can love because you first loved us. We can love because you first loved us. In Romans 5, it says that while we were still sinners, your word says that while we were at our worst, I want us to think about that for just a second. I want you just to meditate on that. I know everyone wants to go, but just think about that. When you were at your very worst, the worst you you could possibly be, Jesus Christ crawled up on that cross and died for you. He did it on his own. Nobody put him on that cross. He went to the cross voluntarily for you and for me. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to give everyone an opportunity tonight. If you're here tonight, you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've never received that, that love. You don't know what that love feels like. I want to give you an opportunity tonight to accept Christ as your personal Savior. I want everyone here tonight just to think about your relationship with God. I want you to think about where you're at with Him. And if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you know you're not the man that God called you to be, or you know you're not being the woman that God called you to be, and you need Jesus Christ in your life, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that this evening. With every head bowed and every eye closed, in a moment I'm going to pray a prayer. I'm going to have everyone in here repeat this prayer after me. The prayer doesn't save you, but the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. So I want everyone in here to repeat this prayer after me. Everyone, please, no moving around. Everyone, just stand where you're at for just a second and repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I admit that I've sinned against you. And I believe with all my heart that you died on the cross to save me. And you rose on the third day so that I could spend eternity with you. So I commit my life to you on this day. That's you and you want to accept that love that God has for you tonight. I'm not going to call you up. I just want you to raise your hand. Look me in the eye and put your hand back down. I won't embarrass you, call you up front. I just want to give you an opportunity tonight to start the greatest relationship that you'll ever have because your other relationships in your life will never be at their full potential until this relationship with God is right first. So if that's you tonight, that you want to start tonight, don't worry about what anyone else is thinking. This is between you and God. You're not going to stand before them someday. You're going to stand before him. If that's you and you want to receive Christ, just raise your hand, look me in the eye, and put your hand back down. I'll wait just a second. Yes, sir. Good job. Anybody else? Anybody else? Don't let your pride get in the way. God's brought you here tonight for a reason. I'll wait just a second. I don't want to rob anybody of this opportunity. I just feel like God is speaking to someone's heart tonight. I feel like God is, is moving in someone's life. Anybody else? I'll wait just a minute. It's the most important decision that you'll ever make. Anybody else? I 
God, we come before you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the gift, the gift, the gift, the gift of marriage. We are so thankful that you give us somebody in our lives to spend the rest of our lives with on this earth. What a blessing that is. What a gift it is. Father, I pray right now that you would just, Holy Spirit, that you would touch every marriage in this place tonight. Every marriage, Father, that you would just bring every person, every husband, every wife closer together tonight. I can't do it. Troy can't do it, but you can do it, God. I pray that every person here tonight will just have a new respect, a new admiration, a new fondness, a new love, a new admiration for their spouse tonight, Father, like they've never had before. Just a Holy Spirit-led anointing on these marriages. God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the gift. Thank you for loving us first so that we could love you and love others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.